This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On April 12th, our Defence and Security Studies program hosted our Spring Conference for 2022. This year's conference discussed whether the West should consider itself to be in a new Cold War or Cold Wars, and how we should respond to the new environment if so. Our speakers and panelists were Dr. Bettina Rentz of Nottingham University, Dr. Michael Dawson, former political advisor to NORAD, retired Lieutenant Colonel Steve Day, former commander of Joint Task Force 2, and Dr. Barbara Falk of Canadian Forces College. We're over to you, and we very much look forward to your presentation. So I will turn my screen off now and uh, Dr. Renz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Eustace, for the uh, generous introduction. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, yeah, so I also had to uh, rearrange my talk a little bit uh, because I'm speaking a bit longer than initially envisaged. And I was asked to speak about the Russian military for about 30 minutes. So I have been researching the Russian armed forces for more than 20 years by now, so I can take the longer view. So I will be speaking about the war in Ukraine. Of course, this is what everybody is interested in at the moment. But I also thought I will be doing something a bit, little bit more academic today to give you the background and some more context for really understanding from the Russian armed forces point of view what we are seeing in Ukraine today. The first question I'm going to start with is one that many people have been asking in the last couple of weeks. Uh, why has the West overestimated or has the West overestimated Russian military capabilities, given the pretty poor operational performance um, that we are seeing in Ukraine right now. Uh, my answer to that would be yes and no, but the most important issue here is that actually this seeming overestimation is part of a much larger and longstanding trend of hyperbole of either overestimating or underestimating uh, Russian military capabilities uh, for a very long time right now. So Russia always had uh, a large military, um, a lot of personnel, and of course, also uh, one of the world's most powerful nuclear uh, deterrents as well. However, up until 2014, when the annexation of Crimea happened, uh, the Russian military capabilities were basically ignored in the West. Not many people were interested in it. Very much the perception was um, they didn't really reform properly. Um, Russia is no longer important as a global uh, military power. And the result of that was not so much that Russia had no longer had a military worth talking about, but this perception of uh, very, you know, that, that Russia was no longer an important military actor was very much the result of viewing Russian armed forces and the absence of reform or the kind of reforms through a Western lens and based on flawed assumptions about what kind of armed forces Russia wanted and needed. This then changed um, in, in 2014. There was large surprise at the ease with which Russia managed to annex uh, the Crimean uh, Peninsula. And immediately the Western views of Russian military capabilities pretty much uh, changed overnight and now completely overestimated Russian military capabilities. A lot of focus as you will be aware of on hybrid warfare capabilities that are now seen as Russia's new way of war and uh, the biggest threat uh, to Russia's neighbors and to the West as well. A lot of propaganda coming out of the Kremlin itself about technological developments, Putin standing in front of screens uh, with pictures of hypersonic weapons and so on. And of course, also the performance in Syria, Russia's first out of area operation then led to an overestimation of Russian military capabilities. Now, six weeks roughly into the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian war, the Russia's war against Ukraine, I think there's again a danger of underestimating Russian capabilities, people talking about the Russian armed forces as a paper tiger um, and so on, on the basis of poor operational performance. But again, I will come back to that at the end of the war. I think this is a problematic assessment. The point is, when we look at Russian military capabilities and try to understand them, we need to bear in mind that there is no ideal type of a modern military, or even an ideal type where we could say this is a good uh, military as such and what makes it good. Because it depends on the context. And we always need to assess Russian military capabilities with respect to their own threat perceptions, 
their geopolitical situation and their defense requirements as a result of this. So I will talk about the war in Ukraine, as I said, but it is not useful to do so without this further context. So I will give you some context about Russian military capabilities before I move on to the war. So what kind of military does Russia want and need? What has been the thinking there in particular since the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991? First of all, let's look at Russia's strategic context. Now, Russia is a very large country, the largest country by territory in the world. It has uh, very long borders bordering many different countries uh, and different types of um, threats as a result. So, from this point of view, mass, a large military with a lot of manpower was always seen um, as important for Russia in order to, to secure this la large landmass and borders. There is some instability, of course, to Russia south, um, the, the Caucasus uh, and also Central Asia, where Russia has faced uh, various conflicts, um, extremism, uh, terrorism and, and some civil wars, where some small wars capabilities were required. But more importantly, from the Russian point of view in the long term, strategically, of course, there's also China, long border with China. Uh, China has a lar very large multi-million armed forces that increasingly well-funded, of course, since the 1990s onwards and have overtaken Russia quite some time ago now when it comes to military spending. Towards the West, and of course, Russia facing NATO uh, and NATO's uh, and, and Western Europe's um, technologically far superior armed forces. What Russia also, of course, observed during the 1990s was that conventional military power continued to have relevance. In fact, this was a time where military power was used more in many ways than during the Cold War for the achievement of foreign policy objectives by the West, by NATO, and so on, to some limited, very limited extent by Russia and its immediate neighborhood as well. When Russia defend, assesses its defense requirements, also it, it starts from the point that Russia is relatively strategically isolated. It does not have strong historical allies that it could uh, depend on or rely on, uh, unlike many Western countries. And of course, also importantly for Russia's assessment of the kind of armed forces that they want and need in the Kremlin's view is that Russia very strongly and always has perceived of itself as a great power. Even when the Soviet Union collapsed and Russia was economically, also militarily relatively weak in the 1990s, there was always the perception that Russia could not be anything by, but a great power um, on the basis of its size and of, um, of Russia's role in, in European history in particular. So large armed forces, a serious conventional military also has an important symbolic um, importance to Russia and also had so in the 1990s, where already the military doctrine expressed serious ambitions about conventional military capabilities that just were unaffordable uh, at the time. Because Russia understands that it was military capabilities, the size of its military and military power that made it a superpower during the Cold War. Uh, and as such, it also Russia, the Kremlin feels that this is also required for Russia's great power status today. So in, in the 1990s, when the West increasingly looked towards um, small wars um, and insurgencies and so on, these defense priorities were not shared in Russia and were not um, shared ever in Russia in, in that sense. Conventional military capabilities and also traditional war fighting were always seen as an important capability to have uh, in Russia, in addition to having some capabilities to dealing with small wars in, in, and insurgencies as well. And of course, in addition to that, a strong nuclear deterrent was always the backbone of Russian uh, deterrence and, and security from the point of view of the Kremlin against the West and NATO and other uh, superior uh, in terms of military capabilities state states. During the 1990s, very little structured reform, of course, went on. That didn't mean that Russia did not have sizable armed forces. So Russia inherited almost 3 million military personnel uh, from the Red Army, uh, a lot of kit, uh, old tanks and equipment and so on. But of course, they were not really configured to the new security environment. So already during the 1990s, there was a lot of discussion that Russia needed to make its military more usable uh, within the realm of its um, possibilities. So understanding that there needed to be more professionalization, that these old multi mo um, mobilization units manned mostly with conscripts were not really uh, particularly useful in the current security environment, uh, more permanent readiness, 
uh, of course, updating equipment. The Russian armed forces received very, very little new kit for the first decade after the end of the Soviet Union because there was very little money available. And also increasingly understanding, especially once President Putin came into power in 2000, that the image of the military as a profession needed to be um, restored in many ways. So the Russian armed forces were known for corruption at the time, a lot of crime and so on. The, the salaries were very low. So actually Russia struggled to recruit um, officers and, and, and soldiers to the armed forces. This all changed then in, in 2000 when President Putin came to, um, to power. Now he prioritized the military from the outset, whereas Yeltsin was actually a little bit suspicious of the armed forces and, and um, yeah, did, didn't want to put much, too much money um, in, into the armed forces. And there was suddenly also more money available. So the oil and gas prices went up considerably at around 2000. And of course, uh, this um, had a, a big impact on the Russian GDP. A civilian was actually put into the role of the defense minister at the time, which was a, a new uh, development for Russia. This was a former tax official, Anatoly Sertyukov, and he was put into the position of defense minister to make the armed forces more uh, cost effective and to deal with corruption as well. And then the military reforms, the, all these requirements that had been discussed for a long time were pushed through with quite impressive speed. So structural reforms move from um, divisions uh, from, from two brigades, a, a, a big rearmament program, cutting down the very top heavy uh, officer corps, and uh, not training uh, changed and was adjusted uh, for the first time since the Cold War. Again, we could see large scale exercises sometimes with up to 100,000 or more soldiers involved. And of course, also quite a lot of propaganda and so called military patriotic education of the of the, um, the population in Russia in order to restore this kind of pride in, in the armed forces as well. And of course, then the success, the military success in Crimea and also of the Syria operations as they were seen uh, in Russia, restored some pride and confidence uh, in, in the armed forces in Russia and also confidence by the Kremlin to use the armed forces. So the point is that the Russian armed forces by 2014 were incomparably better than what they were um, during the 1990s. And this is still the case. But this did not mean that all of a sudden Russian conventional military capabilities rivaled those of the West, as some people seem to imply after the annexation of Crimea in 2014. This was never a realistic assessment. When we estimate Russian military capabilities, we need nuance in this assessment. And I will look at three areas here, um, equipment and technology, at manpower, and also at the defense budget and military spending in Russia. So what was the Russian military technology like in 2022 before the war in Ukraine started? When the military modernization program was announced in 2008, there was um, the perception or the understanding in Russia that only 10% of its military equipment was modern. And at the time, an announcement was made that this percentage would be increased to 70% by 2022. And this has actually been achieved. This was announced by, announced by the now current um, Minister of Defense um, Shoigu uh, last year or so, that now 70% of Russian military equipment uh, was modern. What we need to understand there, though, is that the meaning of modern equipment is quite specific when they speak about that in Russia. It doesn't mean that it is advanced high tech stuff. It just means that it is new equipment that was recently produced. And this is where the Russian defense industry has been struggling and has not been able to make that jump to the 21st century. What the Russian defense industry is very good at and continues to be good at are so-called legacy systems, tanks, fourth generation fighter jets, submarines, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And they have been less, much less successful in developing more modern um, 21st century equipment such as drones, um, any kind of automated automated uh, weapons and so on, five generation fighter jets. This has been discussed for many years, but lots of problems with the production, a lot of corruption in the Russian defense industry. This also is linked to a lack of innovation culture of the Russian economy more generally. So whereas like structural reforms were able to, were, could be pushed through very quickly in Russia, of course, updating and modernizing this massive defense industry is not something they achieved very quickly. One way to, they got around that after 24, um, before 2014 was actually to import a lot of components from the West. So electronic components for shipbuilding in particular, 
and so on. But this, these possibilities were cut off, of course, for the Russians when the sanctions came in after the annexation um, of Crimea since 2014. Now, I think what some Western analysts, especially in think tanks and so on, fell for a little bit was the actual hype that um, President Putin and some other officials uh, put forward about uh, the high tech developments, a lot of talk about artificial development, um, automation and robotization and so on. But this was all just talk. This was ideas for things that are at very early stages of development. And it's not something that obviously is available to the Russian armed forces in Ukraine right now. And again, what we need to understand is that technology, in fact, was never seen as a panacea by Russian strategists. And in effect, um, in, in, in actual fact, many strategists in Russia, strategic thinkers, see this over-reliance on high tech uh, and on technology as a bit of a, a weakness of the West in many ways. Uh, I've read lots of articles in the Russian press, especially military related press, saying, you know, they, they forgot how to fight um, heavy. Uh, so actually, when it came, if it came to a fight between Russia and the West, then this um, or NATO, then this over reliance on technology would not be such a um, such an advantage to the West um, at all. So for Russia, quantity over quality was always um, a bit of a thing where then also the ends uh, justify the means. And this is all, again something uh, that we can see in Ukraine. Uh, to make up for the yeah, shortcomings in technology in many ways uh, with, with mass over uh, quality. Briefly then also about uh, a few words about Russian military manpower by 2022. Of course, the Russian armed forces on paper and so on are significantly larger than the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, by presidential decree, the, Rus the size of the Russian armed forces was set at 1 million men a few years ago. More realistically, most analysts estimated that uh, in reality, the Russian armed forces had around about 900,000 soldiers um, on its books when the war in Ukraine was launched in February uh, 2022, or the, the escalation of the war. Of these 900,000 soldiers, there are 70% professionals, as we, we assumed, uh, and about 30% of the units are still made up of conscripts. Again, what people looked at when they looked at Russian military personnel was uh, the kind of personnel that was used, especially in Crimea and also uh, to some extent in Syria, where, of course, the ground campaign was relatively limited. So in Crimea, there were the newly um, created uh, special operation forces, the so-called little green men. In Syria, also special forces and also, of course, some private uh, military companies and, and so on. And, and there... Um, performance was assessed as quite effective and people were surprised at that. But of course, we have to bear in mind that these kind of highly trained professionals in specialist positions make up a very, very small percentage overall of the Russian armed forces, probably in single digits. Moreover, also, the Russian military also has uh, continues to have retention and recruitment issues. In order to make up for like up to 70% of professional soldiers, a lot of these contract or contract soldiers are actually only on two-year contracts. And this is actually not much longer than, than the kind of uh, military experience that conscripts used to have. So conscription in Russia used to be two years, it's now one year. And now a lot of the so-called professional soldiers also are on two-year conscripts, conscripts, and many of them do not really renew their contract at all. And I already mentioned it, since 2009, we had seen very large scale um, exercises where uh, joint operations were practiced, sometimes even including uh, military personnel from other countries, China, and so on. But of course, exercises are not uh, a, a real life war. And Russia has had no experience in large combined arms operations right up until 2022, because of course, especially the annexation of Crimea was an extremely limited military operation. And in Syria, also the focus there was on air power and standoff capabilities rather than actual fighting on the ground. Then a few words about the Russian defense um, budget, uh, defense economics. One thing that uh, military analysts of Russia always have struggled with was well, the secrecy and the intransparency, of course, of the Russian military budget. This was already the case during Soviet times. Um, and, and increasingly so, especially in the last few years, it has been quite difficult to really estimate how much Russia is spending um, on, its, on its armed forces. 
there are estimations and there are numbers, of course, you can get them from CIPRI, for example, or the military balance also publishes them um, every year. And even if these maybe underestimate Russian military spending, of course, the difference between uh, military spending between Russia um, and then China, for example, and the United States is quite um, significant. I've got numbers here in front of myself from 2020, when the United States spent um, $778 billion per year on its armed forces, uh, China $252 billion, and, and Russia only $61 um, billion uh, per year. Most people estimate that it will be higher than that because we don't exactly know what is included in the Russian defense um, budget. Of course, there are lots of these paramilitary forces like the National Guard and so on that aren't included in these, in these figures. But nonetheless, the sheer disparity is, of course, significant. The US spending up to 10 times more or even more than Russia on its armed forces. We need to bear in mind, of course, also that, that there is a difference in purchasing power. Of course, what you get for a million dollars in, in Russia, of course, is a lot more than what you would get for that in the United States. So the uh, salaries, of course, are, are much less in Russia. Uh, the kit that the Russian armed forces buy from their domestic defense industry is a lot less sophisticated and a lot cheaper uh, than a lot of the equipment uh, in, in Western countries. But still, the difference is quite stark especially if we then also take into account military spending in Russia per S percentage of the GDP compared to other countries. Again, we don't know the exact numbers, but this has gone up significantly since 2000 because of course the increase in gas prices and so on and the economic recovery in Russia very much from 2000 until 2008, um, the global economic crisis has stalled um, since then. So initially, the idea was that this very expensive procurement plan that Russia had could be actually achieved without raising the, the amount of money spent on the military as percentage of the GDP. But this didn't quite work out. By now, people assume that Russia is spending up to and over 5% um, of its GDP on the armed forces. And again, with economic problems and increasing economic decline, de um, decline and this will, of course, get much worse now, much worse with the uh, unprecedented sanctions, this will increasingly be a problem um, for Russia. And there's not really that much leeway in terms of increasing this military spending massively. There are limitations to that. Limitations that people also discussed over the last 10, 20 years or so was that there is a trade-off between spending on, on guns and butter. So there was always the understanding that uh, Putin couldn't go quite as far as some of the um, leaders of the Soviet Union did in terms of over prioritizing or prioritizing the armed forces over everything else, because he still depends his regime on some kind of public um, support. For a while, this, this seemed to be the case where there was a trade off again in terms of you know, not when, when uh, the ec economy became weaker, didn't grow as fast. Uh, there were some cuts to the defense budget, but also some cuts to other budgets, and the Russian military budget wasn't overemphasized to that extent. But I think that by now, especially with this war, uh, Putin's hands will be tied. It's quite clear that he is now prioritizing the armed forces over everything else. Um, probably came to the conclusion that if Russia wants to compete internationally, it cannot do so economically. Uh, it has very little to offer also politically, and that therefore, once again, Russia is going down the path of trying to compete based on military power alone. And of course, this is problematic and I think will be uh, the downfall of the Putin regime ultimately, because already the Soviet Union, of course, saw the hollowness of basing international status on military power alone. So then let me um, finish up here with some words about Russia's war in Ukraine. Again, I've spoken about nothing else for the last six weeks or so. So please ask me also um, any questions that I'm not addressing here. In terms of estimating Russian military capabilities, as I already mentioned, I think there is again a tendency in the West now to misestimate mis uh, Russian military capability as a result of the operational performance um, in Ukraine. And of course, given the hype of Russian um, assumed capabilities after 2014, with all the focus on hybrid warfare and so on, and, and new military equipment, um, of course, this yeah, uh, some people will have been surprised by the performance of the armed forces, uh, Russian armed forces now. Uh, 
Um, I had long cautioned against overemphasizing hybrid capabilities, for example. This was never um, a serious uh, focus of Russian strategic thinking or, or Russian military doctrine. And as we also, as it turns out now, especially when it comes to Russia's neighbor, Ukraine, it wasn't hybrid warfare that was the biggest threat. It was um, pretty poorly reformed um, conventional uh, military power that is causing the damage and death and, and unimaginable destruction right now. Of course, the Russian armed forces are performing badly and people have identified uh, a lot of these issues. Of course, a very poor planning of the military operation seems like the troops were already tired before they even um, moved into Ukraine on the 22nd um, of, fe of February. Um, also, a huge problem with the secrecy of decision making, where it seems increasingly clear that it was a very small circle around Putin that made the decision of what to do and when to launch the attack, where even commanders weren't um, in, informed particularly well about what the strategic objectives were and how to go about it. And certainly plenty of reports about soldiers that didn't even know that they were being sent to a war and were thought that they were just involved in an exercise. Uh, clearly, massive ongoing problems. In, in spite of all the practice they had in those exercises with command control and communication. This was already a huge problem in Chechnya, uh, also in, in Georgia in 2008. And in fact, it was the problems with command and control there that actually initiated the latest round of military modernizations in the first place. Very poorly maintained equipment, uh, certainly no massive advance there made in terms of um, high-tech equipment um, and, and so on. Uh, I think corruption is actually something that a lot of military analysts, including myself, in fact, underestimated over the last uh, few years. So anti-corruption and, and dealing with uh, cost efficiency was a major um, focus, really, of the military reforms in 2008. But as we can see now, corruption seems to be still behind a lot of the inefficiencies or to blame, really, for a lot of the inefficiencies of, of the Russian armed forces. And in spite of all the talk how the pride and, and um, confidence in the Russian armed forces has been re restored and of the soldiers, of course, um, huge problems also uh, with morale um, for various uh, reasons. And this just shows that obviously scripted exercises that people so keenly followed, the Sapat and Vostok exercises and so on, just aren't the same uh, as, as, as a large scale war, which is not something that Rus the Russian Federation, in fact, has been involved in to such extent. But I also don't think overemphasizing those operational failures actually get us particularly far. It is, in fact, the strategic miscalculations that will mean that Russia cannot win this war in the long run, because it is, in fact, unwinnable. It is clear that the strategy was based on extremely poor intelligence. It is clear that the Kremlin bought into its own propaganda about the Ukrainians being like the Russians. No need to actually have proper intelligence because they just assume that they're thinking the same as people in Russia, which clearly uh, is, of course, not um, the case. You know, Putin calling Ukraine, you know, basically denying Ukraine its, um, its statehood, um, calling Ukrainian national, national identity, uh, identity as an artificial construct that was more or less supported by the West. Of course, uh, clearly he bought into his own uh, propaganda in that respect, expecting the Russian government to give in quickly, uh, the Ukrainian government to topple quickly, and for Russian civilians not really to, to mind uh, in, in many ways of um, being uh, occupied by Russia, essentially. It, it, it's, I find this part particularly mind-boggling that, that there was such poor intelligence in this regard. I mean, I've been to Ukraine maybe four or five times, and it was clear to me, to me even, like how th that the Ukrainians uh, were ready and would fight um, to the end if this war was about was going to happen. So the war in Ukraine, as soon as it these strategic objectives, it was clear within a few days that they were unachievable. So the war has become unwinnable. But of course, the question is how does Russia pro proceed from this? And very much as we have already seen, this is turning increasingly into a, a war of attrition, where the sort of immediate operational objectives change on a daily basis, and it's very, very hard to predict where this is going. I'm sure there will be understanding in Russia that operationally there are um, some, some issues, and obviously the initial plan did not work. But nonetheless, we need to be mindful of the fact that in Russia, this war is certainly officially not portrayed um, as 
as a, a massive loss. Um, perception that this is relatively going uh, well. Maybe it did not work out quite well with the immediate um, immediate objectives that Russia had for Crimea. But of course, there's also an international, more international um, aspect um, to this um, to this war as well when it comes to Russia's relationship to the West. And one thing that Putin and the Russian leadership is sure of what they have achieved with this war already is to actually keeping NATO out of this war, exposing in their view NATO's weakness uh, and NATO's hypocrisy. Uh, humanitarian interventions by uh, US coalitions and NATO, of course, have been criticized for a very long time by the Kremlin. Um, this, they were always dismissed basically by the Kremlin as, as hypocritical, uh, the idea that it was not about humanitarian, um, hu humanitarian reasons, but that the West was fighting these humanitarian interventions to expand its own power. And again, now it, 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 the Kremlin sees it with satisfaction that more or less by using nuclear threats, uh, NATO and the West is made to stand by why they commit these atrocities um, in Ukraine. And this conference, of course, is called um, New Cold Wars. From the Russian point of view, what is happening right now is certainly not seen as a new Cold War. Quite the opposite, actually. It has been portrayed and is being portrayed as the end of the post-Cold War. And uh, the post-Cold War for Russia was the time from 1990s until now where Russia was portrayed as the loser in, in the Cold War and, 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 the, and the West and international community no longer perceived Russia as the great power that Russia wants to be seen as. And according to the Kremlin, this war is changing this state of affairs. And the, the foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, just said yesterday, and I think this sums this up quite well, he said, our special military operation is designed to put an end to the reckless expansion and the reckless course towards the total dominance of the United States and the rest of the Western countries under them in the international arena. Um, basically portraying the war in Ukraine as an existential fight for Russia to reassert what the Kremlin sees as their right, rightful position as a great power um, in the world. And I think, again, we need to bear this in mind that, um, yeah, this will make this war uh, very, very difficult uh, to stop and to resolve in the long term. And I will leave it here. My 30 minutes are up. Very happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'm going to take that opportunity, if I may, to ask you a couple of questions. Um, I must say that 30 minutes went by very, very quickly. Um, you, you've provided a, a masterful uh, overview, uh, and we've learned a great deal. Um, so a couple of things I'm interested in. You, you talked about, about corruption in the defense industry and in, and, and in the Russian military itself. Do you think that, that Putin overestimated his military capabilities um, because he himself didn't understand the extent of the corruption and that perhaps money that he thought was being spent on on equipment or training or whatever was actually going into the pockets of, of some of the senior generals or some of the other oligarchs. And therefore he himself really didn't understand the extent of, of the capabilities that he thought he was deploying. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I mean, this is something, of course, corruption is notoriously difficult to study. And for a very long time also, even during the 1990s already, when I started studying Russian politics and, and and I went to Russia speaking to people, they all said, you know, the corruption is something you, you can't just look at, you know, different parliamentary parties and, and, and elections and public opinion. You need to look at corruption because this is what drives Russia in, in many ways. Uh, and this, of course, is still the case today. But the problem is it's very difficult to estimate. But to your question, yes, there are some indications that this is indeed the case, that you know, on paper, everything looked pretty well, especially when it comes, for example, the question of the use of conscripts. People were surprised that conscripts were sent into the war in Ukraine pretty much right from the beginning, um, whereas this is actually not envisaged by, uh, by you know, Russian rules and regulations that conscripts would be used um, in, in, <laughs> in, in a war of this uh, nature. So people have suspected that even if on paper, uh, it is seventy percent of units or so should be staffed by 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 professional soldiers. That in many cases this this wasn't the case. But then when certain units were called up 
and then were um, expected to bring a certain amount of professional soldiers and they weren't available that then younger conscripts were bullied into signing contracts or sometimes uh, there are stories about contracts forcibly being signed for them and then them being sent into the war so that's one one example then also everybody knows the examples of the out of date food for example also uh, very likely there that this is a result of um, of uh, corruption that these um, you know it, it, logistics various aspects of logistics that things just weren't restocked or actually bought as intended uh, some of the equipment uh, quite badly maintained uh, and so on as well so yeah I think this is a massive um, problem in a way you you be surprised that Putin should be surprised by that because of course he is also massively corrupt as it, it, it is endemic in Russia from on every level it is up it's unimaginable uh, really that that people would think that you know if they pocket so much money that then that the same wouldn't be the case for all other levels including in the military and also in the defense industry but it is a huge problem and I think this is something I I didn't overestimate capabilities to that extent in terms of the you know operational capabilities and so on but I certainly lost sight of the fact that corruption is still a massive problem and has not been dealt with at all because again this is not something you can just root out within the military it if if it is so endemic at in all levels and all aspects of society and politics in mm -hmm. russia yes of course this this was one of the um this was one of the things that we observed in afghanistan where you know in effect they had ghost soldiers you know money that was supposed to be uh, paid to the soldiers was essentially kept by the higher commanders uh, and they would produce false uh, nominal roles indicating how many soldiers they had on on strength when in fact they they had nowhere near that so you know when the uh, and you know the question was really uh, one of perhaps we ought not to have been surprised at the outcome let me let me put it let me put it that way um, so at this moment, the, uh, the Russian forces seem to have maneuvered away from Kyiv in general and have moved further back to the area of the Donbass where they seem to be uh, about to launch uh, a, a, another offensive. Do you think that in the time that they have had to regroup um, that they will have learned any lessons? Do you think that they're going to be more effective in the Donbass than they were in Kyiv? Or do you think that they are still going to experience um, similar problems related to command and control, logistics, intelligence, etc.? What's your, what's your view on that? I mean, we, we will see, um, of course. Um, I guess the, the whole, it's just, I guess, a different kind of area, different difficulties uh, they aren't from. They have put now a, a single person uh, into command. We know is the the, um, the commander of the southern military district who has a lot of experience from against Syria. I think also Chechnya already. Of course, the Chechen war wasn't exactly a, a massive military achievement. Um, but so, so it's likely that operationally there will be some improvement. But of course, the the problems Russia has encountered is about more than than just some small lessons learned or some small adjustments right there's still the problem of the uh, morale um aspect of course the the poor equipment um i'm not sure whether uh, you know i don't think these things will have been overcome in such a short amount of time and of course we have to bear in mind the other side as well of course a big surprise also has been the performance of the ukrainian armed forces although i also think that that, that was unjust. It was a problem to underestimate that beforehand. Of course, the Russian, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces, also very sizable, uh, two hundred uh, military personnel. Uh, of course, they had fought a war already for eight years in this particular area in the, in the Donbas, so they have a lot of experience there. A lot of their um, uh, higher uh, staff, of course, have know exactly how the Russians think. They they also were trained in, in um, together sometimes in, in depending on, on their age and so on. Um, the, Rus the Ukrainians, of course, the big advantage they have is uh, absolutely outstanding motivation. They are fighting a war of national survival, whereas a lot of the Russian soldiers have no idea what they're actually fighting for. So I think this 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 will also be um, this will be quite decisive again in terms of 
not allowing Russia to to achieve a, a decisive victory. So, right. yeah. Hmm. Um, can you comment at all on on how the Russian army is is organized in the sense of their their uh, tactical groupings? Um, my my history sort of talks about, in, for example, the Second World War, the Russians seem to be very effective in terms of command and control of huge uh, fronts. You know, you had front commanders with divisions and division groups and just masses of masses of soldiers and guns. Um, ha have they reorganized themselves into smaller tactical groupings? And if so, doesn't that doesn't that potentially compound their command and control issues that they, they can't maneuver all of these smaller groups? Um, this is, I, I can say a couple of things about that, but the, like tactical art is not really, that's not really what, you know, I, I don't work in a military college and I'm more or less a, you know, a, a historian um, in a way, not a military historian, more a historian of contemporary Russia. So, I'll tell you as much as I know, but I, I'm not really the best. Per That's not really uh, what I focus on, because, again, I think sometimes actually getting bogged down in, in the, that lower level stuff, actually, then you lose sight of the bigger strategic picture sure. and which then leads to over underestimation. But what, from what I understand, what everybody's been talking about are um, these battalion tactical groups where they have um, the, the, all different like artillery and tanks and also anti-aircraft um, uh, equipment um, involved. From what I can tell, people have said that these are undermanned in some ways, and therefore it made, um, made it much easier for the Ukrainians to target them. So a lot of these, but and people had, again, this was seen as a major innovation uh, of the Russian military modernization, but it really, again, has really not delivered what people uh, had expected because it was, yeah, the, the Ukrainians were able to counter that. Apparently they've lost quite a lot of those groups, so they've regrouped them, but people suspect that some of them are just like put together from the, you know, the <coughs> leftovers from some of the ones that had been targeted. Again, when it comes to tactical art though, I, I, I don't really feel qualified to say much more than, than that. That's understood. Um, one of our viewers um, is interested in your thoughts on these uh, hypersonic uh, missiles. Um, they evidently have extraordinary range and speed and are apparently capable of penetrating traditional anti-missile defense systems. Um, those would be a pretty significant threat to, uh, to NATO forces if those in fact exist uh, and are capable of doing what the Russians say they're capable of doing. Do we have any evidence? Have we seen any evidence that they've been using those kinds of hypersonic weapons and there was and, one uh, report that apparently they used um the the delivery vehicle like the the, the hypersonic thing to deliver like a, a dumb bomb um it says it's, i can't remember it was right at the first two weeks of the war okay and then this was uh, you know people talked about it a lot again this but here what i said before i think actually looking at individual technologies um especially that you get these buzzwords of you know hybrid warfare hypersonic weapons and um, I, I just don't think this gets us very far. Russia could pose an absolutely major threat to NATO, of course, because Russia has a massive um, nuclear arsenal. But I think if it comes to a clash between NATO and Russia, it will not be a single technology like hypersonic weapons that will give Russia an edge. Um, and because, again, I think it, Russia has no intention of fighting a conventional war against NATO. We, what would they couldn't and and what would be what would be the the point right. um, of, of that right i'm not saying there might not be any i'm not saying there's no danger that this war could escalate i think there's actually a pretty big danger but i think then the hypersonic weapons is not really our biggest problem if it For comes sure. to that um, so again i'm a bit I, i'm a I'm not a tech, technophobe or anything like that but I'm, again i think it's looking at these sort of so-called individual innovations it, it takes the eye off the ball of what Russia Russia wants and, and what the overall threats are. Just like hybrid warfare, for example, I think got us down the wrong path. I mean, of mm -hmm. course, there are challenges there, absolutely, in terms of election meddling, cyber and, and, and so on. But ultimately, 
as the Ukrainians now saw, it's, it's you know, it's, right. it's, it's, yeah, these buzzwords um, aren't really, okay. shouldn't really be our major focus. That, that's right. my, my opinion. Yeah. Well, we'll I'll, I'll just end it with one last question before we head to break. Um, so we'll move back up to the strategic level. Um, and that is the idea that, you, that there has been this traditional belief that Russia likes to uh, trade uh, space for time. In other words, the interventions by Napoleon and Hitler um, you know, allowed the enemy forces to, to penetrate into Russian territory so that Russia could then regroup uh, and mount the counteroffensives that they, that they did, which turned out to be successful. That idea is based on having that, that, that Western buffer zone uh, that was part of the Soviet Union. Um, so the Polans and the Hungar Hungarians, so, all, so that group of states provided that, that insulation, so to speak, between Russia and the West. But in the modern world that we live in with satellites and hypersonic missiles and all the rest of it, is that still a valid belief on the part of Russia? Do they still believe that they require that Western buffer zone for their, for their security? And therefore the Ukraine is only part of the rehabilitation of that buffer zone in your view? No, I think this is much more about status. It's about status for Russia. Um, and, and it's not about uh, an actual security threat or the, the, the need to have a buffer zone. Of course they talk about that, but really the focus when Russia talks about Ukraine and, and other neighboring states is the so-called what Russia calls its sphere of influence where they feel that traditionally, because you know Russia, you know the Russian Empire, and then also um, the, the you know the Soviet Union, and and so on, that Russia traditionally and historically has got the right really to be yeah. the, the hegemon in that in in that area, which, which of course, well, it, Ukraine is a, a sovereign state and has been for thirty years, I think, but and and Ukraine of course was a neutral state um, until twenty fourteen, right? The only reason why Ukraine wanted to join NATO in the first place was because of Russian military aggression in 2014. Uh, right. NATO membership in Ukraine was a complete political non-starter up until 2014. And only when they understood that, well, that's the only reason really, or the only way they could secure themselves, they wanted to join NATO. Um, so for Russia, what Russia doesn't like about Ukraine is that they can't accept that Ukraine is a sovereign independent country. Um, they can't accept that Ukraine can make its own decisions about its um, domestic and foreign or foreign policy. So again, when people now talk about the neutral, neutral status potentially of Ukraine, this is of course hugely um, problematic because Russia would not be happy with a neutral Ukraine like they weren't happy with a neutral Ukraine up until 2014. What neutrality would mean from the point of view of Russia would be Ukraine basically like Belarus is now, that mm. it can have like sort of nominal sovereignty, but really uh, it can only continue to exist if it basically does what Russia says. And obviously, yeah. this is not a condition that the Ukrainians could ever accept, very understandably. Yeah, a sort of vassal state, uh, yes. you know, to, to, yeah. the, to, 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 to Mother Russia. Um, 